Good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, watching this. I'm going to be having a discussion tonight with two pastors, Pastor Matt First and Pastor Scott Clem. We are going to be discussing Daniel's 70th week. And what we are hoping to accomplish tonight is to have a profitable conversation about a very controversial issue. And if we succeed, I believe this is going to be a rare moment in the IFB just because profitable conversations are very rare. Most people, they've decided what they believe on an issue and there's no way they could possibly be wrong. And uh, But the truth does not fear an examination. And so what we're going to be looking at tonight is Daniel's 70th week. And is it possible that Daniel's 70th week has already been fulfilled? That's what I want to get to the bottom of tonight. And so nobody sitting here tonight is a preterist. Uh, every one of us believe that Jesus is coming back and that there are, the events of Revelation uh, are still to come, at least most of them. Uh, and so if we believe uh, in a rapture, uh, a coming mark of the beast, you know, then what does that mean if we are saying Daniel's 70th week has been fulfilled because most people believe it's all future. All the things we talk about in end times are contained within Daniel's 70th week. Whether you're pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, most people believe that. So we're also going to discuss what that what does that mean if Daniel's 70th week has been fulfilled? Does this change how we should look at things to come? Uh, and if so, what does it change? And so another thing too, um, can good people disagree on these things? You know, where do we draw the lines when it comes to fellowship. And I'll just say where I personally draw the line is I believe you must believe in a literal, physical return of Jesus Christ that is to come in the future. You must believe in a literal resurrection of the dead. I'm not going to negotiate with people on those two things. I also think it's extremely important that you believe that we'll be delivered from the wrath before God's wrath is poured out uh, and that you're a premillennialist. I think that's very important. Uh, I don't believe you have to agree that every single thing that's associated with end times is future, exactly like I do, except for the resurrection and the gathering of the rapture. So ultimately, what I want to do tonight, look at the different positions of Daniel's 70th week, and I want to find out the biblical basis for those positions, and then I want to kind of see what kind of hermeneutic is being used. How are people come to these conclusions. What is the Bible basis? And so just to kind of start off, um, you know, Pastor First, if you want to uh, go ahead and say hi to the audience, I know a lot of my audience knows you. And then after that, Pastor Clem, if you'll introduce yourself, uh, this is the first time uh, I've had a discussion with you. So go ahead, Pastor First, and say a little bit about yourself. Yeah, Matt First, and uh, written two books, uh, Who is Israel? And then this, this one here, Which One is Right? just came out. Um, and been pastoring in Custer, South Dakota for uh, over 15 years, uh, 18 years, and uh, in Wyoming before that. And um, my friend Scott Clem is with us tonight. He actually wrote the, wrote the forward for the new book that just came out. So I'll turn it over to him. Yeah, hi, uh, Scott Clem. I live in Gillette, Wyoming, pastor Central Baptist Church. I've been here for, I've been here for, uh, what is it, 16, 17 years. Uh, I've been pastoring the church for about three years now. Um, I, uh, uh, yeah, not, not, much, not much else to say. Been f uh, friends with Matt for quite a long time. Met him at uh, a youth camp. It's where I first met him. And uh, he is really uh, the, uh, the impetus behind me actually searching these things out for myself. And, um, and as I wrote in the forward of the book, my, my whole intent uh, was to, um, I guess you could call me uh, maybe um, uh, maybe a little bit cocky. I guess I was gonna I was gonna prove Matt wrong. I was gonna study these things out. I was gonna understand them from his perspective so that I could poke holes in what I thought was uh, the wrong thing. Uh, but it turned out the Bible persuaded me. And so uh, anyway, this has been um, this is you know I think we all have our our areas that we really like to dive into and dig into. This is one of those for me. Um, in particular, when it comes to uh, to Daniel and um, and this whole idea of Daniel's seventy weeks prophecy, I mean, it, re it really is a linchpin for the modern 
uh, the modern theories, you know, the most popular theories that are out there today, it's a linchpin. Um, and so uh, it's going to be fun discussing this tonight. All right. Okay. Yes, and if you haven't seen the discussions we've done in the past, um, we I did one about four years ago, Pastor First, about his book, Who is Israel? Uh, just a great book, and then recently did one on, you know, which one is right. And I tell you, ever since I've read this book, it has just got me really thinking about how, you know, I am interpreting different scriptures, because there were some very legitimate things brought up, especially with Daniel 9... That I've heard before, I've seen videos on the internet, I hadn't really heard it from any trusted source, but then, you know, when I kind of saw how you came to your conclusion, you know, it got me looking, and it's like we've kind of taken the Bible and we've turned it into these book where we get a bunch of proof text for things, where we just take a phrase, take a verse, isolate it, and then we come up with our own, uh, you know, interpretation of it, and we just kind of do whatever we want with it, but you know, uh, you can't really do that with the Bible. You got to make sure you're using a proper hermeneutic that you're taking it in context. And so, um, I enjoy being challenged on stuff like that. And so, when it came to Daniel nine, I guess since I've read that book, I've really been looking into that a lot. And I feel like I'm right there with you guys on this subject. It's just one of those things, though. I feel like I need to talk out some things. Uh, I need, uh, I still have a few questions about how this affects other things. And so it's just not something I've completely thought all the way through yet. And that was why I wanted to have this conversation. And I believe this is going to be uh, very good. And we decided we wanted to record this too, because I figured other people would probably enjoy this conversation and get a lot out of it. So uh, hopefully you do. And we're going to start off in the first question uh, that we're going to ask is so if you believe that Daniel's 70th week has been fulfilled, how was it fulfilled? You know, what, what was the fulfillment of that? Uh, you know, Pastor First, you want to go first on this? Yeah, well, uh, I believe that, that it was fulfilled uh, through Christ. And uh, when he came on the scene, um, it says in verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, upon thy holy city, to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. I think all those things happened when Christ was on the scene. Um, obviously, people are still getting saved. There still is iniquity, but that iniquity, as far as I'm concerned, is over because I'm saved and I'm forgiven. My salvation is secure and my sins have been washed away. And I think that's what that means there is to make an end of sins and to make a reconciliation for iniquity. As far as I'm concerned, that's, that's a done deal. And to bring in everlasting righteousness. As soon as I got saved, I had everlasting righteousness. Amen. So uh, I believe all those things are fulfilled in Christ. And I think to anoint the most holy was when Jesus was baptized I think, and in fact, it says in Acts chapter 10, I think it's verse 36, 37, something like that. Um, it, it talks about how that his baptism was when he was anointed. And uh, we know from Luke and other passages that the spirit of the Lord descended upon him. And, uh, and then as soon as he was done being baptized and tempted in the wilderness, he went and read from Isaiah and he said, the spirit of God is upon me and, and I'm anointed. So um, I really believe that. And I think if you're a Baptist, you got to like that because we like the fact that you know, Baptist, you know, the church was Baptist. Christ started a Baptist church and it started with the baptism from John. So uh, I get that. And I'll, t I'll give you a source. I don't agree with everything. The guy was not premillennial. So I'm going to qualify that by, before I say it, but Philip Morrow is a great source is for a lot of this, especially for the Daniel stuff. And uh, if anybody's got a problem with me saying that, let me remind you that Philip Morrow in three different chapters is in the fundamentals and everybody recognized the fundamentals uh, compiled by R.A. Torrey. Uh, but Philip Morrow was a lawyer. He was a Christian lawyer from hundred years ago. Uh, he wrote several books. This is one of them, the 70 weeks. Um, he wrote some more. Um, he even wrote one about the authorized version versus, I think it was the, the revised version. Uh, the guy was a good guy. I don't know why he wasn't premillennial. Uh, I wish he would have been. I, I push him a lot more than I do, but, um, he's worth reading, but it's not just him. 
Um, you go back and you look at Haley's Bible Handbook. Uh, you look at um, uh, John Wesley's notes, the Geneva Bible notes, uh, Matthew Henry's notes, and you're going to find that Daniel chapter 9 is not about the Antichrist, but that they believe that it was the fulfillment of the 70th week in Christ's time. And in the midst of the week, he caused the sacrifices and the oblations to cease. Well, three and a half years was his ministry. And in the midst of the week, what did he do? He died on the cross. Well, that, there's no greater event that caused sacrifices and oblations to cease than that one. And, uh, and so unless someone has gotten to you ahead of time, in other words, if you are a young Christian who just got saved and you had no preconceived idea, I don't think you could possibly read Daniel 9 and get Antichrist out of that chapter. I think someone's got to brainwash you in order for you to think that way. And um, the, co the context of the covenant, um, you know, he'll, co you know, he'll hit in the midst of the week in that covenant um, that confirm the covenant, not break the covenant. Show me in the passage where it says he'll break the covenant. It says he'll confirm the covenant and he'll cause the sacrifices and the blessings to cease. Well, the beginning of chapter nine talks about the covenant. So how can it be a different covenant at the end of the chapter? Um, it's not an antichrist covenant. And, and Pastor Williams is who I give the credit to for my understanding and coming to see it the way I see it now. He uh, He's the one who told me that Daniel 9 is the watershed issue. And once you understand who the covenant confirmer is, and once you understand that it is not talking about an antichrist, but it is talking about Jesus Christ, and there are so much, there's so much, like I said, older commentary. I, I didn't even name all, all of them, list all of them to you. Um, James Usher, uh, even John R. Rice called him the covenant confirmer at one point. Uh, there's just so much there. The, the treasury scripture knowledge uh, cross-references that compiled by Tory, even that points to Christ as being the covenant confirmer. And when you see that, you real, it just changes everything. But see, that totally unravels the pre-trib doctrine it completely unravels it and um and that's the part i give credit to uh philip morrow because i do think he's worth reading on that point i think he was right i think he was wrong about his millennium and his millennial thinking but i think he was correct in pointing out the dispensational uh view and the what he called the modern view which in his time it was the modern view of pre-trib he he called it out and he was right to do so and he stood on the king james in that way um but anyhow, that's that's my long answer to your question. Okay, that's good. Yeah, no, that's really good. And so, you know, Pastor Clem, I'll let you say something along those lines too. But I, I was kind of ask you this. I don't know if this is something you're kind of prepared to, uh, you know, give us a rundown on this. But it is important that, you know, when we look at that verse 24, and he says he lays out the things that the 70 weeks are meant to accomplish, you know, and he mentions to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy. You know, I think it's important that you look at each one of those things and say, are there places in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, where we see those things come to pass? And, you know, do you believe that there's scriptural evidence to show that those things already happened? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I do. Um, and just to, you know, I'll expand on that, but just to kind of back up, you know, when we when we take a look at this prophecy here, I think it's important to, you know, what, what's our hermeneutic when we're when we're looking at this? And I think that's where it's really important. Matt, Matt touched on this, you know, when I was first introduced to this passage, um, and I couldn't even remember or tell you when necessarily that was. I can just remember hearing preaching on this passage. And, uh, you know, you'd have some pastor somewhere who would look at verse 27 and say, well, see that he there, that's the Antichrist. Um, without actually uh, discerning that from, from the context. And so uh, oftentimes what we do, particularly when we look at a passage such as this, is we read our theology or we, re we read our preconceived thoughts into the text rather than reading the text in its proper context and letting the, the text uh, tell us what it is and conforming our thoughts to it. And I can just tell you that that was probably one of the more difficult things for me to do, to unhitch myself from, from the theology that I was taught and grew up in 
and and just to let the Bible speak for itself, you know, and figure out well, who who is the he in verse 27. And, and 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 you know, when you look at this, by and large, there's there's a lot of agreement wherever where you know wherever one really is is stationed on this subject. Um, verses 24 down through 26, by and large, are you know people are in agreement. We're talking about 70 weeks or a period of 490 years. Um, it's a prophecy that's particular to Israel. It's got six objectives there in verse number 24. And, and that's that's an important you know uh, point to note out is these are 490 determined years. These are these are cut out of time in order to fulfill these six objectives. Therefore, these six objectives must take place within that 70 years determined. They can't take place in any gap of time. They can't take place afterward. They can't take place before. It must take place within that 70 years determined because that's the whole reason for the prophecy. And so then we're asked, you know, we're left with the, the question is, well, if, if this is future or if this is in the past, we should be able to go elsewhere in scripture and find out how these things were fulfilled. I mean, we have, I mean, you think about the New Testament and, and the New Testament expands and unfolds on how Christ has fulfilled so many of these prophecies. So we would, we would likely see the same thing here to my, to the futurist friends out there that believe that this is still yet in the future, that there's a gap of thousands of years between the 69th and the 70th week. We have to somehow find fulfillment of these six things somewhere in a future 70th week. And that's that's the real challenge. Where do you find that in Scripture? How do you how do you say that a future Antichrist in a future 70th week is going to finish the transgression? What does that look like? How is a future Antichrist in a future 70th week going to make an end of sins? Right. But we can look at our New Testament and we can see that the majority of these things are fulfilled in the cross of Christ. Amen. That, 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 his, uh, that his crucifixion um, is the, the climax of this entire prophecy. And he does those very things. He finishes the transgression. And, and I can, you know, uh, I, I do have some verses there I can, I can give you for, for each and every one of these as far as, you know, finishing the transgression. Isaiah 53, 5, right? He was wounded for our transgressions. We know that. Um, Isaiah 53, 12, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong because he had poured, his soul, uh, poured out his soul unto death, was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Um, Hebrews 2, 14 through 15, for as much then as children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part in the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, to deliver them who were through death, uh, through the fear of death, were all their lifetimes subject uh, to bondage. And, and what we find there is Jesus, what did he do? He stopped death's advance. We know that, 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 uh, because of sin, there is uh, there's death in the world, and he stopped its advance by dying for our transgressions, rising from the dead. Um, you know, you could go on and on to make an end of sins. Did Jesus, in fact, make an end of sins? First Peter three eighteen, Christ is, uh, has also suffered for the sins, uh, for the just and for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Hebrews ten. Uh, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Did he make an end of sins? Amen. You bet he made an end of sins. And we could go through each and every one of those things. But that's the point is, is you can look in the New Testament and see over and over and over again, biblical evidence to support how these things were fulfilled and they were fulfilled in the cross of Christ. Amen. Right. Yes. And that, see, that's good. And I've heard. In some of your guys' messages, and I've never seen anybody do this that believes this is future. I mean, where you do, you give examples in the New Testament of those things, you know, being done. Where the New Testament says it happens. You know, you know. Uh, in fact, just today, I watched a video about Daniel's 70th week. And the guy was saying how not all this is done yet because, um, you know, Israel, uh, you know, they're, uh, they still have their sin. And, you know, God's Jesus is going to make an end of sins. He's going to bring reconciliation for iniquity. He's going to finish a transgression. And so they're saying it's not done yet. 
But then, you know, I got to thinking about Romans chapter 11 and verse 26, and everybody knows this verse, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness for Jacob. Now, everybody yeah. wants to make that future, right. but in Acts 3, 26, it says, Unto you first, God having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And Pastor he, McMurtry, the only way they could be right about that is if no Jew has ever gotten saved. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, and that's we, a good know, point. we know that's not true. In fact, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so it, it's it's just they're trying. Satan is trying through these people. They don't even know it, but he's trying to fool the Jews into thinking they've got a second chance. But the Bible says now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Hebrews says today, if you'll hear, hear, your, hear his voice, harden not your heart. And so it's today. It's now. It's not future. It's the greatest lie that ever lived. I think the most anti-Semitic thing in the world is this pre-tribulation doctor that doctrine that tells people that after the rapture, they're going to get a second chance. And we know that there are Jewish ministries that don't even witness to the Jews right now because they think that, that they'll help them to just trust in Jesus by being nice to them now. And after the rapture, then they'll turn to Jesus. Yes. Yeah. And that's horrible when you hear that. So, yeah, I feel like listening to you guys. You know, you guys are given very clear examples of how all of the all six of those things were done, showing New Testament where those things were done. And so then when you stop and when you start thinking about this and you see that these things specifically, these 70 weeks are for uh, Jerusalem and people always want to say well, it's for the Jews. Right. You know, they make it all about Israel. No, it's specifically for Jerusalem, for the holy city. And so the thing is and for the temple. And for the temple, right. So and he cried, he cried, it is finished. And the veil ripped in two from the top to the bottom as soon as he cried that out. Right. So here's, I guess, a challenge to people who believe this is future is, can somebody explain to me how Daniel's 70th week applies to a global tribulation? Because in every chart of things to come, everybody starts with Daniel's 70th week. They that That's the chart. You know, that's the go-to. Daniel 70th week, midpoint, abomination, desolation, and after that, great tribulation. And we've we've all seen these things. But um, it, it doesn't make any sense to make Daniel 9 your go-to passage for a seven-year tribulation that's something that's, co that we're, that's coming for the whole world. When this is a prophecy specifically about Jerusalem. And so... Um, you know, I think that's a very important thing that these people need to do is show why we would talk about some worldwide thing with Daniel chapter nine when it's about one city. They they insist on seven years, but when you pin them down, they can't show you other than Daniel nine. They have no other place to go to show seven years. Right. Uh, and then when you start to show them how that the first half of that seven years is Christ. And the midst of the week is the sacrifice and oblations to cease. You're asking Pastor Clem about New Testament proof of that. Um, in the Spanish Bear Bible, came out in 1569, so before the King James, by Casedro de Reina of the Reina Valera. Uh, Reina has a marginal cross reference for Matthew 26, excuse me, for Daniel 9. He, he has you in Daniel 9 27 when it says, Confirm the covenant with many for one week. He has a cross-reference for Matthew 26, 28, which says, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. So you remember, testament and covenant, same word. Mm -hmm. And shed for many. And that's the cross-reference that Raina had back to Daniel 9, 27, concerning uh, confirm the covenant with many. And, uh, and so um, even back in 1569, Raina in the Spanish Bear Bible um, was pointing to Jesus in Daniel 9. Yeah, that's very that's very interesting. And it does. It seems like all the older sources all say that that was done. It's this seems like a newer thing that came with dispensationalism. We'll probably say a little more about that in a little bit. But yeah, so another challenge too to put out people who believe this is future, you need to tell us what it means to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. You know. <clears throat> And how the tribulation does that. 
I mean, it seems like things exactly. Jesus would have done. Yeah, th these things have to, again, they have to take place in the 70 weeks determined. Um, I've had people who have challenged me and say, well, well, listen, you know, as far as there's not everlasting righteous. Have you looked outside? I mean, there's there is not righteousness going on right now. And then I challenge that person. You know, if you're saved, do you have everlasting righteousness? Of course you do. He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I am righteous because Jesus made me righteous. But the fact of the matter is, you know, so they'll point to things like this, that, that verse, you know, everlasting righteous. Well, that's going to happen in the millennial kingdom. But we also know that at the end of the millennial kingdom, there's going to be an uprising, right? There's going to be, that's not righteousness. You know, when you have the devil deceiving a bunch of people and they declare war on God, that's, that's not righteousness. But besides that, that is well outside of the 70 weeks determined. So these things, and, and this is the thing that I, you know, I, I try to stress to people, these six things have to take place within the 70 weeks determined. And as we look at this in particular, you know, you talk about the, the futurist view and why that is. The, the, the thing that I was challenged with is, okay, I should be able to find in the text, in the context itself, that says somewhere, gives me some indication that God has hit the pause button after the 69th week, and now we have thousands of years in this gap period of time. But the text itself doesn't even allude to that. I mean, here we have it, 70 weeks are determined. Um, and, and, and that word determined there literally means to cut out of time. You're, these 490 years are cut out of time for these, these six things. So when we go through there, I can't find anything in the text in those, in those four verses uh, that would illustrate to me that God has hit the pause button after the 69th week. In fact, the ev evidence, all of the evidence suggests that we have a continuous, um, the, these, these weeks go on in a continuous fashion from the, from the very beginning. And the very beginning is, or the, the beginning of these weeks is very clear cut. It's from the, uh, uh, the command to restore and to build Jerusalem. That's when the timeline begins. And then we can move that on forward. Everything is continuous. And so it naturally, we would come to the conclusion then that the 69th week would follow after the 70th week. And of course, the text alludes to that. It doesn't suggest that there's a gap of thousands of years. I don't know exactly where that gap came from. Uh, you know, Tommy, you had mentioned it a little bit as far as with the advent of dispensationalism. I think that's that's part of it. But they manipulate and reinterpret this portion of scripture really to support the preacher of rapture. Every, I mean, this is why I call it a, a, a linchpin because it, it, it all rests on this idea that there's a future seven years and that Jesus has to come in a secret pre-trib rapture before that seven years begins. But none of the text actually alludes to any of that. And if you take that away, if this, in fact, is fulfilled in the past, then you don't have a future seven-year tribulation. Well, then what you do, as Matt said earlier, it completely begins to unravel. And then you're forced to rethink your theology and, and actually get your nose in the Bible and read things in context to see how it really is going to play all out. Well, and on, on top of that, they say the church age will end. And I, I just think the church age never ends, you know, and and uh, and I think I, I think that Schofield um, inserted the the gap theory. And I, 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 I blame him for two gap theories. I blame him for the gap theory in the beginning and I blame him for the gap theory at the end. I think I think he's got two of them. And then so now they, they take that. And I'm not saying Schofield was the original, but he's the one that, that inserted it right into the Bible with his notes. Um, and then they take that and they they call it jamming the clock you know, uh, and, and uh, they, they consider Israel to be God's timepiece in 1948 and all that. Um, but yeah, so once you're, at, once you're brainwashed that way, it's hard to get unbrainwashed. It's hard to admit that. And even post-tribbers uh, are having a hard time. And so when I, when I saw uh, a resurgence of, of post-tribulation versus pre-tribulation coming out about seven or eight years ago, I realized that even though guys were starting to figure things out, um, they, they were still talking Daniel 9 as if it was uh, in the future, you know, the 70th week. And so that was part of the reason why I wrote the book, um, to help clear that up. And, uh, and, and it's causing people to have to scratch their head and, and ask questions because 
I, I, I can dig up old, old commentaries and find and show you where it was just commonly thought that, uh, that uh, Christ was the covenant confirmer. And in the midst of the week was Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Uh, my pastor, Williams, um, he, at the time of his thesis, when he was writing, um, he thought that maybe there was a pause after the, the crucifixion and the last three and a half years are still future. And, uh, and he, I think he thought it for two reasons. I'm, I'm just going to guess. Uh, I think he thought for two reasons. One is because he is still confirming the covenant with many even now. And so that's legitimately understood. And secondly, because there is three and a half years in Revelation. And so he kind of thought that maybe the pause or the jamming of the clock was in the midst of the week. And I'm okay with that. You know, I, I, I'm okay with that. I, I used to think that way too, but, but I'm kind of leaning more to the determined, that 70 weeks are determined, and that it was truly about the nation of Israel, the Jews, and the, the city of Jerusalem, and it has been completed. And, and we can't prove how, how that was done. But, but uh, the 70 AD was about a three and a half year period of destruction when they destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. And it was the people of Jesus, people of the prince, that turned the temple into a, into a fortress. And Titus had no choice but to destroy the temple. Titus didn't want to destroy the temple. The thing was absolutely beautiful. But, um, but the zealots turned it into a fortress. And if you read Josephus, they fought with each other. The Jews were actually... Some of the Jews were wanting the Romans to take over because the, their own side was so crazy with jealousy and insanity that they were just killing each other and robbing from each other. But in the end, over a million Jews were killed and uh, they ran out of wood. They were making crosses to crucify the uh, in, insurrection and insurrectionists and they ran out of wood for the crosses. It, it's, it's a horrendous uh, reading and it, and it fits with what Jesus said. Uh, there'll be ne uh, never a time like it. Um, and, uh, and so I think it was a horrendous uh, event that uh, seems to go totally ignored today um, in Bible colleges and in, in most uh, Christian thinking. They don't ever talk about the destruction of 70 AD and what it did to, uh, to everything. And of course, it destroyed the Judaism system. It destroyed the temple system. Mm -hmm. And it was within the generation that crucified Christ. It was only 40 years or less than 40 years from the time that Christ was crucified and so that generation, there were still people alive at the time of the destruction of the temple that uh, were there when Jesus was crucified. So uh, there's so much that fits with all that, that I do think the 70 weeks are determined and are complete. All right. So, and this brings me to, you know, a question I have too, when it comes to the gap, because we've been talking about this gap between the 69th and 70th weeks. So this is something I've really been pondering on. And an area where I have not come to a conclusion. And this is where I want to see if you guys can help me out. So the one thing that was very interesting as I've been studying this, when I went, I started in Daniel 9, because I've been trying to define every little thing with Daniel. You know, trying to forget the textbooks, you know, timelines, charts, you know, go off of Daniel's language, how it's been used in other parts of the book. So as I was going through the chapter, you know, you see, and I'm not going to read the whole chapter, Daniel after reading the book of Jeremiah that talks a lot about a new covenant coming, he realizes that 70 years are determined upon Jerusalem, or 70 weeks, and which is 490 years. Everybody agrees on that. When he realizes it, he realizes that these, this judgment that's coming, it's coming from God. That he's doing this because we broke his covenant. And then he prays a magnificent prayer asking God not to do this. The angel comes to Daniel and basically says, hey, we heard your prayer, you're loved by God, but 70 weeks are determined. He tells him these 490 years are coming. The angel basically in this passage that everybody focuses on is an angel speaking, basically telling Daniel, your prayer is not getting answered this is going to happen. And so um, these 490 years, they seem, I mean, it's very clear. These are set. These are coming. So there's no way to get a gap in from just from Daniel chapter 9. So I guess the challenge that I have to those who believe it's future is, has there ever been another example 
of a gap whenever a timeline has been declared. You know, when God told Noah 120 years and a flood's going to come. You know, when God told him, you're going to be in the wilderness for 40 years. You know, now I change my mind, I'm going to add 10. You know, are, are there any examples where a timeline's given? Can you, Have you guys noticed any? You know, or is it always just that set amount of years? And so if there is a gap, you know, when a set time was said and every other time we see that, it's exactly what it is, then what is your biblical precedent for inserting a gap? Where do you go to in the scriptures to get a gap? Exactly. We, we yeah. should be able to find that in, in the context of the passage. If there's, if there's a gap, it should be clear. And, and as you, as you pointed out, right, Daniel is, you know, at the beginning of this chapter, he's, 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 um, he was reading Jeremiah in, in, in Daniel chapter nine. He realizes that that they've been in captivity almost 70 years. Jeremiah promised that they were going to be able to go back to Israel after 70 years, which is part of the, the reason that he's he's praying here. Um, could you imagine if God, you know, told him, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's year 68 and God says, well, I'm going to hit the pause button and, um, and it's going to be another 120 20 years and then I'm going to restart the clock. And, you know, that wouldn't be 70 years. That would be, you know, 190 years or whatever the case may be. Or if we did the same thing with with um, with the resurrection. Right. Jesus said he was going to be three days and three nights in the tomb. You know, if if after the second day, you know, God hit the pause button and it was going to be another 10 days in addition to we would think that's bogus. That's that's crazy. Three days means three days. Three nights means three nights. 70 years means 70 years. 70 weeks determined means 70 weeks determined. It's 490 years. It's continuous. And nothing in the context itself suggests that there is a gap. So we must let the text speak for itself and conform our thoughts to it. And that word determined is the only time, that Hebrew word behind the word determined, that's the only time in the entire Bible it's ever used. It's a special word. And it, it just means it's determined. It's not undetermined. It doesn't say 70 weeks are undetermined. Says so seventy weeks are determined, and uh, and so uh, it, 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 to answer your question, it makes no sense. It's like giving someone directions to drive sixty nine miles, and then at the seventieth mile, well, we don't know exactly how far that one is. Mm. That that's undetermined. That that makes no sense. You have sixty nine determined weeks, not seventy determined weeks. It should read according to them. It should read sixty nine weeks are determined, and then there's one week out there we're not sure exactly what is. And, it, and then it extends it beyond the canon of Scripture, which then makes us, human, man, man, to be the determiner. Is that who's supposed to be the determiner? Because that's kind of what's happening here. We're taking God's determined weeks and deciding that we can determine what it is. I, I, think, I think that's dangerous territory to enter into. And uh, so I, I believe it's concerning Jerusalem and the people of the Old Testament, and it was determined. But the beauty is... The beauty is, is that God still gives a, an opportunity for these people. He's He's taking away their temple, and he's allowing it to be destroyed because of themselves. Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself. He's allowing them, and, and of course, you know, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, I wanted to gather you like a mother hen gathers her chicks, and you would not. Uh, and so upon you will be these de desolations, which is the words the same as in, in the, the book of Daniel concerning desolations. And so... Uh, your house is going to be left unto you desolate. But that doesn't mean God was finished with them. We're not saying that God's finished with Israel, because if they'll get saved, he'll never be finished with them. Um, so there's still an opportunity. He wants to confirm the covenant with me. Uh, so when they try to put words in our mouth and say that we're anti-Semitic or that, we, that we're saying that God's finished with Israel, God's never finished with anyone until they die and go to hell. Right. And so there's still opportunity for them to be saved. Yeah. The, the other crazy thing about this whole idea of a gap between the 69th and 70th week, I mean, if you look at the text really carefully, verse 25 in particular, it tells us that essentially after 69 weeks, the Messiah would be revealed. And of course, if you do the, the timeline and the math and all of that, you find out, found out or find you find out that after the 69th week or at the end of the 69th week, who is being revealed at is public baptism. It's none other than Jesus. And, his, and, and his public ministry begins, which naturally would start the 70th week. His, his And think about that. 
you know, to, to, to opponents of, of this, uh, that this has been fulfilled in the past. You're, you're telling me that as soon as Jesus was revealed at his public baptism and was beginning his public ministry, God hit the pause button. So therefore Christ's ministry was not in the 70 weeks determined. And so the cross was, was not in the 70 weeks determined that happened in the gap of time. And they give the antichrist all the uh, front center stage. Right. That's instead the of Christ. Instead of Christ getting all of the honor and glory, they give the 70th week to the Antichrist. They don't even realize they're doing that. Uh, but they are they are taking away what was the epic, you know, uh, the the ultimate, uh, <clears throat> the pinnacle of the entire thing, which is Christ himself and focusing on Antichrist. Who do you think is behind that? Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. yeah, I like um, and I'll just I just read this because Matt brought up a, a good a good point. Um, I, I do have Phillips Mar- Morrow's book here, The Seventy Weeks in the Great Tribulation, and and I like how he does it. These are pretty these are pretty scathing words, and um, and you know I know this might chap some of our our pre trib brethren, but he says this. This gives to the last week of the seventy the importance that it should have, of which prophecy as a whole demands seeing that all the predictions of verse 24 depend upon the events of that last week. On the other hand, to make this last week refer to a paltry bargain between Antichrist or a supposed Roman prince as some apostate Jews of the future for the renewal, and that for a space of only seven years, of those sacrifices which God has long ago abolished forever, is to intrude into this great scripture a matter of trifling importance utterly foreign to the subject in hand and to bring the entire prophecy to an absurdly lame and impotent uh, conclusion. Therefore, we conclude that the modern interpretation, which takes Christ and the cross out of the last verse of the prophecy, where it reaches its climax and puts Antichrist and his imaginary doings into it, does violence to the scripture and serious wrong to the people of God. In short, it robs God of its glory, uh, of His glory, which is exactly what the devil wants to do. He's he's come to steal, kill, and destroy, and he wants to rob God of, of His glory of the cross. And and this is this is the 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 uh, the, the, the pinnacle moment as, as far as this this prophecy is the cross of Christ. And so, and anyway, I, I appreciate what Morrow says, um, and, and wholeheartedly agree with that statement. Amen. It's- I- and who do you think's behind it? I, I just, I, I think this is serious. I mean, but besides just arguing eschatology, this is serious because we got a bunch of people out there who think that the prince in verse 26 is the Antichrist, when actually the prince is Jesus. And yeah. the Antichrist, and then they have the audacity to say, well, I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. No, the truth is you guys have been focused on, on the Antichrist when you should be looking at Jesus in, in Daniel chapter 9. Well, Bingo. you know, it's going to, it's hard to admit you did that. And it's going to be yeah. hard for a lot of people to admit they, that they did that. Of course, that. of course, of it's, course. It's, well, I, it, 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 it is. You, you're put in a precarious situation. Um, you know, and, and I got first kind of flagged onto this, and we might might get there. Verse 25 talks about the people of the prince who shall come. You know, if you look in the original King James 1611, that that prince is capitalized. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, the, that's the thing that got me scratching my head. Um, as a King James guy, I think, wait, wait a second. It, it's capitalized, indicating divinity. Um, and, and that's what got me going down this thing. But, um, but um, you know, with that, that was a struggle for me. When, when I looked at this, I, I thought to myself, am I making the Antichrist Christ? And it, that, that does. It's kind of, that's an unsettling thing because you're, you're not wanting to attribute something to Jesus um, you know, that, is, that, that you may think it has to do with, with Satan. On the other hand, if this does have to do with Christ and Satan is stealing God's glory by making it about a supposed antichrist, well, that's equally just as, as damning and damaging. And, and that's where, where, you know, when you think about this, if this prophecy isn't isn't eschatological if it's not referring to the a future and prophetic things then what is it all about and quite frankly it's messianic 
And if it's messianic, it's, it's rich. That's where if you go through those six things in verse 24 and you cross-reference those things in the New Testament and you see how they're fulfilled, I mean, this is just rich in showing how this prophecy is messianic and what Christ came to do. I mean, it's completely uplifting and glorifying to him, which is exactly what it's designed to do. Right. Amen. Yeah. So here's here's the big question for me that I can't totally answer yet. And that is, you know, I hear, what, I hear what you're saying about the gap. I mean, yes, it does not seem to make sense that there would be a gap. But yet we talk about 70 AD. Doesn't that still create an almost 40 year gap? And, and so, and I and I think what most, I think this is probably your guys' position. This is where a lot of people land. You know, they believe that the death of Christ was that midpoint. And then the stoning of Stephen ended the 70th week. And, you know, I think that's that's very credible. The only thing is it still seems like some things haven't happened yet that we would include on the desolations of Jerusalem that don't happen for another 30 some years. So don't we still, isn't there that still a gap? I think what you need to do is look at verse 26 very carefully. Okay. Um, and so it says after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. You put that together with the seven weeks before that you're talking 69 weeks. Mm -hmm. So he tells us that after 69 weeks, the Messiah is going to be cut off. It doesn't tell us when after 69 weeks, it just says sometime after 69 weeks, the Messiah is going to be cut off. And it says, but not for himself. And then, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So two things happen sometime after 69 weeks. It doesn't tell us it's going to happen in the 70th week. It just says after 69 weeks, the Messiah is going to be cut off and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's it. That's what scripture tells us. And so when we, when we look at the fulfillment of these things, was Christ crucified after the 69th week? Yes, it happened to be in the midst of the of the 70th week, but that's neither here nor there. We get that from verse number 27. Was the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, did that take place after 69 weeks? Yes, it did. It took place uh, about 40 years after the crucifixion of Christ. It took place outside of the 70 weeks determined. But it's not saying necessarily, the, the language isn't telling us that the destruction of, the, of Jerusalem and the temple is going to take place in the 70th week. It just says sometime after 69 weeks, it's going to happen. And in fact, that very thing did take place. So for me, I don't have any heartburn over that. Just looking at what scripture actually tells us. Otherwise, you know, to, to try to say that the destruction must be in the 70 weeks determined, I think is trying to we're reading something into the text that isn't there. It just simply says after 69 weeks, these things will take place. And they took place after 69 weeks. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I agree. Cause yeah. Cause then too, you know, after he says, and he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and ablation to cease. And I'll tell you, cause I had looked into this idea before, but here's what threw me off. And this I think is what throws a lot of people off. When it says he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease, that's where they get the Antichrist, you know, breaking the covenant. And then it says, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. That sounds like, because, you know, it's the Antichrist that does the abomination of desolation. But the thing is, if you go back in the chapter, when Daniel is praying to God, asking, he's asking God not to bring these things on Jerusalem, these desolations that are coming he's attributing it to God. If you go back to Deuteronomy, I forgot what chapter it is that I believe Daniel referred to where he's talking about how we broke your covenant and all the things that you sp said would come on us, spoken by Moses, are, are come. All of these things that God said he was going to do, God did, and God said it was him doing it. Even though God used the armies of Rome and Titus and people like that, um, Daniel, Moses, you know, they credit it as being done by God. So um, their action, the idea of it being the Lord causing those things to happen is actually consistent with the rest of the chapter. And I mean, it, it lines up perfectly with the rest of the chapter. And that's, uh, uh, that, that's like a, a whole sermon you almost need to preach, and we're not going to do that right now. 
but I, I see what you're saying because it just it kind of seemed like if we're saying the because and they said to and I've read too in Josephus it, it it does appear that the whole thing that came on uh, the siege of Jerusalem. There was like a seven-year period where a lot was going on, and there was like a three-and-a-half-year siege when they took down the temple. And so I think that's why a lot of people try to put it there. But, uh, again, it's just like you kind of have to take a pick. And, um, you know, I, I do agree there shouldn't be a gap, but does everything in verse 26 and 27 have to all happen within that 70 weeks, or do you guys think it's okay to say that, in that 70 weeks, he will cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease, which he did, basically setting it up for the desolation until the consummation. Would you say that until the consummation would be what happened in 70 AD when it was completely obliterated? Correct. I I, I do believe so. Um, you know, if we, we look at that verse 26 again as well, just to kind of go back to that. You know, the Bible says the people of the prince sh that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, this is where some of the you know people start to part ways as far as interpretation, because people want to make that prince there. Um, they say, well, that's that's got to be the Antichrist. Um, but again, if we look at it, it's in its historical context. It can only mean one of two people. Right. People will say, well, historically, Titus was the one who destroyed the city. In the sanctuary so that prince has to be titus okay um that that's one possible solution but think about it from you know if we if we look let the bible define itself um because the bible's you know the, the best commentary that there is on itself hosea 13 9 when when referring to the northern kingdom of israel remember the northern kingdom of israel was destroyed by the nation of assyria the southern kingdom of judah was destroyed by babylon but in Hosea 13, 9, who does God say gets the blame for Israel's destruction? Mm -hmm. He says, O Israel, thou hast destroyed my uh, thyself, yep. but in me is thine help. It's and that like, is it's kind of like America. It's kind of like America. We're destroying ourselves. You know, uh, we got more enemies in Washington, DC than we do in the Middle East or anywhere else. Um, it, we we as a nation have destroyed ourselves, and that's what that's what Israel is. Dead. So when it says the people of the prince, the people did the destroying, not the prince. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Just just as Babylon was a tool in the hands of God and Assyria right. was a tool in the hands of God, Rome was a tool in the hands of God. But who is responsible for their destruction? It's the people themselves. Why, think of why would why would God allow this? Because of their covenant unfaithfulness. If they were not unfaithful to the covenant, God would have protected them, which is exactly what Moses said. In, in um, what, what is it? Let me get back over here. Acts chapter three. Um, uh, oh, let me find it here real quick. Acts chapter three, verse 22, quoting Moses says, for Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say to you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet referring to Jesus shall be destroyed from among the people. Anybody who is destroyed, it comes from themselves. They destroy themselves because they reject Jesus. That's and right. the Jews rejected Christ. And so back in Daniel there, who, who destroyed the city and the sanctuary? It was the Jews. They brought destruction on themselves because they rejected the Lamb of God, which taketh away right. the sins of the world. Amen. And so when we get to verse 27 then, you know, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. What's that covenant? It, who is the he? The he is an antecedent pointing back to a previous character. Who's the previous character that's been revealed? Messiah, the prince. So he, Messiah, is going to confirm a covenant. He did. It was the new covenant. Matthew 26, 26 through 28 tells us that. He shall, in the midst of the week, he shall cause sacrifice and oblation to cease. How long was Jesus' ministry? Three and a half years. What happened in the after that three and a half years? He was crucified on a cross. And he is the one sacrifice for sins forever, according to Hebrews. And because of that, there is no, there is no more remission for sins. Jesus is it. He is the final sacrifice causing all other sacrifices and oblations to cease. But some would say they didn't, they didn't quit offering sacrifices. 
you're right. And so the question is, what does God think of animal sacrifices in Mm -hmm. light of of their rejection of the Lamb of God sacrificed on their behalf? I'll tell you what he thinks about those abominations. Amen. And what is the Bible? Overspreading of them. Right. Mm. Over the, for the overspreading of abominations, you know, it's, it's abominations that cover the land. Yeah. What are these abominations? 40 years of continual animal sacrifices, really spitting in the face of God, rejecting mm. the lamb of God who is given for them. Can I, and so, can I, can I, can I look interrupt? at it? Go ahead. Um, exactly. The overspreading of abominations was the fact that the veil ripped in two and somebody obviously sewed it back up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Somebody obviously sewed it up, and for 40 more years, they kept overspreading abominations. It says in Isaiah, you offer me a sacrifice, it's like offer me a pig, pig's flesh. Uh, uh, I am, I, I'm done with your sacrifices. I'm sick of them. And, um, and, and so the animal sacrifices became an abomination. And any animal sacrifice, and I'll contend with a pre-tribber, how can God allow and, and be content with future animal sacrifices for three and a half years. Exactly. How can there ever be a future temple with animals being sacrificed? See, today, Jews in New York City are killing chickens and slinging them around in, in the streets of New York City and, and offering the blood of a chicken. It's all an abomination. It doesn't matter if it was a lamb. It doesn't matter how kosher it is. It's an abomination. Why? Because the lamb has already been slain. The lamb's already died on the cross and risen from the grave. And so all these are abominations. And so for 40 years, he tolerated these overspreading of abominations. And finally, he had the temple destroyed because of their abominations. And in the footnote of Josephus that I have, it points out a very interesting point. And I mention it in my book. It says, you know, for, for for thousands of years, the Old Testament saints had Passover. And they all gathered back to Jerusalem for Passover. You talk about a vulnerable time to to be attacked. If 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 Jerusalem, if Israel's enemies wanted to attack them, Passover week was the week to do it, because they're all huddled together and not and, and they're all focused on a sacrifice of a lamb. And so, if you wanted to really mess with them and terrorize them, that'd be the week to do it. And you know what? There has never been in all the history of Old Testament Passover. There has never been an attack recorded in history, except when you see 70 AD, where God allowed Titus to come in, and because they would not submit to Titus and stood against him and turned the temple into a fortress, there were over a million people slaughtered, and they were all gathered in one place. And that's that's just not coincidence. It's because he took his blessing off the Passover, because they were still having Old Testament sacrifices, and he took his protection and blessing off. And I think that's why Jesus said to them in Matthew 24, when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, get out. Mm -hmm. And he's talking to those early, that first century, he's talking to those Christians. He's saying, when you see it surrounded with armies, you get out. And, uh, and so they recognized that it was time to get out. See, that was a warning. He was warning those people. And he said, all these things are going to happen on this generation. He's, he knew it. And so, as I said earlier, the, there were people that were alive when Jesus was crucified, that were alive when that temple was destroyed. Yeah, exactly. You know, someone someone might argue and say, well, Jesus quoted this this verse in, um, in Matthew and, and in Mark, you know, when Jesus says, um, you know, the, uh, referring to Daniel and the, the abomination of desolation, right? But he, here's the thing to keep in mind. The scripture specifically in Daniel 9, 27 says for the overspreading of abominations, plural. Now, some may think that's not a big deal, right? What's the difference between singular or plural uh, in, in Matthew and in Mark, Jesus says the abomination of desolation. Amen. It's singular, now, is there a difference between singular and plural? Yeah, the Apostle Paul made a big deal about just one little letter, one S, when it comes to the seed yeah. of Abraham. Not seeds, but seed. And so it's the same thing here. So what is what is Jesus quoting from when he says the abomination of desolation? Well, there's two other references in Daniel that also talk about the abomination of desolation. One of them is uh, Daniel 11.31. In particular, re, uh, referring to Antiochus Epiphanes, and the other one is twelve eleven. I believe that Jesus is quoting Daniel twelve eleven, just by process of elimination. Um, but but the point is, is that yes, these are these are abominations so what is, what that is overspread, that covered, and because of that, he was going to make it desolate. 
And this shouldn't be any surprise because when we look at our New Testament, Jesus warned them. I mean, talk about a merciful God who would allow 40 years to go on. He's long suffering, not willing that any should perish. Before his death in Matthew chapter 23, he's, uh, verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And so we, I mean, it, 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 it segues perfectly with what is recorded there in Daniel. They continued to reject Christ. They continued to offer their abominable an, animal sacrifices. And God stayed true to his word. And he destroyed that city. And he destroyed those people. And not only that, but the mention of Daniel's abomination of desolation from Jesus is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But it's not mentioned in John. Right. Because I believe John wrote after 70 AD, and I believe that John had no reason to write about it because it was already a past tense by then. And I also think that it's not in Revelation for the same reason. But on top of that, Luke chapter 21, when Jesus said it, he said, For these be the day of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to those that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in this land and wrath upon this people." And I think he's talking about 70 AD there, not something future. And on top of that, he says that all things which are written may be fulfilled. When Jesus said that, Daniel was written, but Revelation wasn't written, and neither were any of the Gospels when he said that, but Daniel was written. So he's talking about Daniel, but he's not talking about something future as we're being told today. Right. So, yeah, and I want to read this, too, because, I mean, you guys are giving me a ton of stuff here. I mean, this this is really good. But I want to point this out, too, in case somebody out there is just getting offended. You know, we're saying that God's doing this to Jerusalem. Well, in Daniel 9-11, says, Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And I believe this is a reference to Deuteronomy 28, very long chapter, powerful chapter. You must read through the whole thing. But let me just hit a few highlights. It starts out saying, blessed if you do all these things. And then you get to verse 16, it says, cursed if you do all these things. Or in verse 15. But then in verse, um, let me jump down to uh, verse 35, Deuteronomy 20. It says, the Lord shall smite thee in the knees and the legs with a sore botch cannot be healed. You know, the, in verse 36, the Lord shall bring thee and thy king, which thou shalt set over thee into a nation. In verse 49, the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far from the end of the earth as swift as the eagle flieth. So it's saying God's doing this to you. And so in Daniel chapter 9, in verse 14, it says, therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us referring to these 70 weeks of desolations. Verse 16 says, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city, Jerusalem, thy holy mountain. And I'm reading all that because that was one of the areas where my hangup was, is I'm looking at that passage in Daniel 9, when it, and when it's talking about the overspreading of abominations and he shall make it desolate, and I'm thinking, well, that has to be the Antichrist. Well, not according to what we've been reading in chapter 9. No, that's the Lord. Not according to what we read and what was prophesied in Deuteronomy chapter 28. It says it's the Lord that does set that. So it was the Lord that caused all these things to happen because these things were judgment on Jerusalem, which is again what the 70 weeks are all about. Judgment on Jerusalem, not a global tribulation in the future. When Jesus is sitting there at the end of Matthew 23 and he says, your house is left unto you desolate. Does it really matter how it happens? I mean, he's right. obviously he's obviously signed off on the on the permission for it to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and and whether it's Roman soldiers, whether it's Nebuchadnezzar, whatever it is, they brought it upon themselves. And that's what I meant about America. America is destroying herself right now because we're bringing it upon ourselves. We can point to you know, all these conspiracy theories, and we can point to all the whatever we want to point to in the politicians, 
But the truth is we brought it upon ourselves. And uh, the same thing happened to Israel. As he, as he read earlier in Hosea, Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself. Right. So here's a very important question that I know is going through a lot of people's minds because there's been a lot of talk about abom the, the abomination of desolation. So uh, most people believe that there's going to be an abomination of desolation that takes place in a third temple. And in 2 Thessalonians 2, we see the Apostle Paul referring to the man of sin standing where he ought not. Um, so do you think the abomination of desolation has happened? Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? If not, uh, what, it, what do you think it's going to be? Well, I think stand, standing where they ought not was the people standing in the temple, the zealots, the Maccabees, standing in the temple, uh, and that's, that's the fulfillment of that. They, they, they had, unless they were Levites, they had no business being in there. And so I think that's part of the abomination is that they're turning that into a fortress. But as far as the Antichrist or the man of sin uh, sitting in the temple showing himself that he is God, uh, I'll let Scott start off with that and maybe I'll add to it if, if I want. But. Sure. I, I believe this was, was fulfilled in the past. This comes from the Olivet Discourse recorded in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. And if you're going to understand the Olivet Discourse, you can't just take one of those past, you know, one of those books in isolation. You really should compare Matthew, Mark, and Luke because they all describe the same event. Um, and, and so with that in mind, if we, I mean, if we take a look at Matthew uh, chapter 21, or excuse me, not 21, Matthew chapter 24, um, and we look at what Jesus said. He says in verse 15, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Notice the instruction, let him which be in Judea flee into the mountains. All right, Mark says something very similar. Verse 14, but when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the end of the prophets, standing where it ought not, but him that readeth understand, then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. All right. And then if we look at Luke, what does Luke say about this? Luke says, and when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then you know that the desolation is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. So when we take all of those things together, we get a, a, a picture of what's going on. So what, what is this referring to? Well, I believe it. Again, when you take a look at the Olivet Discourse, it all started by the, the disciples saying, look, look at these beautiful, uh, you know, temple stones. And Jesus is, is responding by saying, look, all of these stones are going to be thrown down one upon another, of course, in paraphrasing here. And then they ask, well, when are these things going to be? So this is an expansion of, of what Daniel has prophesied, and Jesus is expanding, telling them what's going to happen within their generation, within their lifetime. And so the abomination of desolation, I believe, is, is when, I, I, in particular, I believe it's the Roman army. Um, now think about this. Jesus told them, he said, when you see the abomination of desolation, then flee and run for the hills. Well, if we look back at this history, it was about 66 AD, I think it was November of 66 AD, when the Roman army started surrounding Jerusalem. Interesting thing, uh, where history tells us that Christians, when they saw the Roman armies started surrounding Jerusalem, they, they fled. Mm -hmm. They went to Pella. They, they, they took off for the hills. But some people stayed behind. And, and Josephus tells us that there came a point that if you didn't leave early enough, the, the, the Romans weren't allowing anybody out of the city. They would allow Jews to come in for the feast days, but nobody could get out. So if you didn't heed Jesus's warning by leaving early and leaving quickly, leave right now and head for the hills, you were stuck in Jerusalem. If and I so can time, if I can call a timeout for just a second. Go ahead. And that's what Jesus warned them. He said, mm -hmm. you know, pray that your flight be not in winter. And then he also said, when you see it, then leave. And so, the people who stayed because they wanted to celebrate Passover, well, guess what? If you're a Christian, you're not celebrating an animal Passover with a temple anymore. And so there is part of the problem. The unbelievers stayed and they got caught, as I was pointing out earlier. If Think about it from this point, too. If the abomination of desolation, and I do think it has something to do with the temple itself, right? 
But by the time that the, the zealots were holed up in the temple, and by the time the Roman armies came up onto the temple mount, if you were a Jew in the city, you saw that, you couldn't leave. Right. How, how could you flee for the hills once you see right. that happening? It's By that time, it's too late. And so I believe the abomination of desolation in particular is the, is the Roman armies. I think it has a, 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 a greater fulfillment, if you will, when we consider what happened later on, how the Jews, uh, the Jews, the zealots hold, the, um, hold themselves up into in yep. the temple. They had made it their last stand. It was their Alamo. They were standing right. where they ought not. Right. And the Romans came in standing where they ought not as well. And, and let me, burn the temple with the Jews inside. Let me let me stop again and say, uh, another pastor friend of ours points out the fact that if 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 you're going to say it's the Roman army standing in the temple, that's too late. Like you just said, it's too late. But if you see Jews who have no business being in the temple, then that should be a warning to you that hold it. That's abomination. You ought, they ought not be in there according to their own Old Testament rules and regulations. And so I think that's what that means. And when they saw the zealots going crazy and just going against their own religion, which which is just insanity, then that that was the that was the signal. You get out while the Romans are still friendly. You get out because it's going to get ugly soon. Mm -hmm. So, OK, yeah. And, and this is another area where I'm, you know, still working a little bit and struggling, I guess. So and I get that, too, you know, and it um, that, you know, that makes sense. But then in Revelation 13, uh, you know, when talking about the Antichrist, it mentions in verse 5, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it talks about him making war with the saints and all that. So that sounds a lot like what we see in Daniel where he's exalting himself above all that is called God. And, you know, the apostle Paul sounds like he's quoting Daniel 11. Doesn't it seem like there's a strong connection here between Daniel 11, second Thessalonians two, and what we're reading here in revelation 13. And we've got two, it's like the beast is coming to power and he's got 32 or, uh, you know, he's got, uh, you know, 32 months or uh, three and a half years, 42 months, I'm sorry, uh, 42 months left. This kind of sounds like, you know, the midpoint of a seven year period. So do you think that Revelation, I mean, obviously I know you believe that Revelation 13 is still to come, but do you think that has any connection to any of the prophecies about the abomination of desolation or second Thessalonians two even? Well, um, I'm sure Pastor Clem will answer, but I, I was going to say that Pastor Williams, he points out that temple in the New Testament after Christ, you know, after the book of Acts, you know, the temple, the temple, as far as God's concerned, the temple is the church and the individual believer who makes up the church. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. As a church, you are the temple of God. And so... He said that that, you know, Second Thessalonians chapter 2 could be referring to uh, the fact that our churches are becoming apostate and, uh, and how that, you know, we have false doctrine and false teaching and false preachers within the churches. Um, and then in Revelation 11, when it says, there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein, he just points out how that, how do you measure people, you know, them that worship therein, I, you know, and so is it really a physical temple? I'm not saying there won't be a future temple built, because I think if there probably could be, and if it is, it'll be the, the largest idol the world's ever seen. I think, I think it's going to be, uh, if it's built, if there is this temple built, I call it third, I don't know if it's third, but it, this future temple that's built, um, it, it will it will mesmerize the average evangelical. Um, they'll just become giddy over it. And if they're doing animal sacrifices, it it'll be absolutely wicked and foolish. Uh, but it'll be against the Book of Hebrews um, and everything else about Christ and His blood. 
But I, I think I think we focus too much on physical temple because when you look at the New Testament, you got to realize that after Christ, physical temple doesn't matter. You know, God said back in Isaiah, "What temple can you build me? Uh, heaven's my throne, earth is my footstool." You think I'm impressed with the temple? You know, my temple is the church, you people, and uh, and you know, your body's the temple, and I dwell in you. And then in, you get to the end of Revelation, and it says there is no tabernacle because uh, he dwells with them and he tabernacled among them. I, I think um, on this point, it's important to remember that Christians, um, uh, Christians need to remember that we're not going back to shadows and types. Right? right. Hebrews tells us that we, we have a better priest offering a better sacrifice and a better tabernacle. We have a better covenant. Amen. Jesus is not going back to this, to the, to the shadows in types and even so, moses's tabernacle was a shadow of the real one in heaven the true one in heaven exactly so if if and it, that's a big if if there is a physical temple that is built it is not god's temple amen um we're not going back to shadows and types and if animal sacrifices are offered that is an abomination that's right now, i personally believe i didn't always, always used to believe this but i'm convinced more so of scripture when when Jesus says, "Behold, your house shall be left unto you desolate, and and you won't see me until you say, Blessed is the blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord." When we couple that with Daniel nine again, um, for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation. And then back over in Luke, when Luke says. Uh, they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive of all nations. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. My, the thing that, that, that and uh, my brother Gary Brooks pointed this out, Jerusalem, e even today, the Temple Mount is still in a state of desolation. Right. What is sitting on top of the, uh, of the Temple Mount? A Muslim mosque. The Jews, the Jews don't even control the Temple Mount. Uh, the the Gentiles do. Gen, you know uh, these 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 Muslim Gentiles, and so I believe personally that it's going to be desolate until Jesus Christ comes back again. I don't believe that there's going to be a physical temple that will be built, and that's a bold claim. And maybe I'm wrong. I'm willing to admit and concede that I could be wrong on that. Now that said. Does that mean as far as, uh, you know, let's look at uh, Second Thessalonians, right? That, that's what was that was mentioned there. Um, I, I, Matt, Matt said it best. When we take a look at temple, um, the, the temple that is emphasized in the New Testament is, is the church. It is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is, which is people. And in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, um, we're, we're told there, verse four, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or his worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. All right. So is that temple there? Is that a physical temple? Well, it doesn't necessarily need to be. And I don't know, you know, I'm, I'll share this with you. I'm not, I'm not so sure that I am completely sold on this idea, but I, I, I think I understand it. You know, if you look back in the, um, you know, uh, the, the reformer days, they believed that the Pope was the Antichrist. Right. And you think about it, if a, if a temple is a, is a group of people, right, you might have a false temple, so to speak, the Roman Catholic Church, all of these people. And who is the Pope? Well, he, he is the, the self-described vicar of Christ, the one who stands in place of Christ. They call him Holy Father. They, he, they, through him, they deny the Father and they deny the Son, which is the very definition of Antichrist. And, he, and when he speaks ex cathedra, he is essentially speaking as if he is God here on the earth. And so I, I do believe, I don't know if the Antichrist is going to be the Pope. But I think that's a description, if any, and we right. who knows if Jesus right. comes back here pretty soon um, and, and perhaps we find out that the Pope was the Antichrist. Right. Um, and Jesus explains that to us later on. Right. Um, yeah, but I, I think these things can be, be fulfilled in ways that maybe we're not used to thinking about that. That's kind of the gist. Yeah. And, 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 and I think Pastor Williams is onto something when he said in the New Testament, the temple was not physical anymore after, you know, after Christ was crucified veil ripped in two when the veil ripped in two that's a that's a pretty good signal that god's done with the temple the old temple 
And, uh, and I think the Protestants were on the right track when they saw the Pope as sitting in the temple. Uh, but we know that uh, the Catholic Church was, was not really the church anyway. But the point is, is that they were on the right track as far as how they're thinking. And if I lived 500 years ago, I probably would have thought the Pope was the temp was the one sitting in the temple as far, you know, if I'd have been persecuted like they were. But I think the idea is there. And that's why I think that even pre-trib doctrine, uh, this will probably make somebody mad, but even pre-trib doctrine helps to set up all this because like a John Hagee and those people, if, if a temple gets built, and I don't think God has anything to do with a future temple getting built. But if a temple, if a quote unquote temple in Jerusalem gets built, whether it's on the Temple Mount where the mosque or the Dome of the Rock sits or in the other place that some people think it is in Jerusalem, I think it I think it'll be completely anti-Christ, obviously, because it's going to be all about everything but Christ. And I and I do think it will be a huge idol. And I think the John Haggies of the world and those type of people will be absolutely giddy over it. But I think a lot of them are apostates anyway, and they're not truly saved. And so I think it will separate the sheep from the goats. But I agree with Pastor Clem that God will not be involved in it. But could it happen if it will help mesmerize people for the apostasy? Then, yeah. Uh, but then again, we should be looking at Second Thessalonians saying, my goodness, you know, look at this. But right now, I think we have apostasy. I think we have Satan sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You know, just during the COVID time, there were churches who took government assistance. They took government money. Uh, you know, you know, the special government aid money during COVID. Uh, we're seeing uh, churches all over uh, that are capitulating in different ways. And of course, the vaccine and all that stuff. Um, so I think that 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 there is uh, there is a takeover of the temple. I know a good guy in Australia right now that his church has like thirty thousand dollars in fines because he hasn't stopped having church and uh, he's standing up to his government. Uh, but he's he's under the gun. And uh, and so and we know about Canada and even some places in America. So you can see the takeover of churches uh, that's going on. And of course, the apostasy that's involved as well. Uh, and so I, I do think that this temple, I, I think of it spiritually. I don't think of it uh, physical and I don't let those things bother me. Wow. Yeah. And just, you know, this this gets back to uh, Tommy, you mentioned this kind of at the very beginning as far as you know, can can brothers disagree, especially when it comes to future prophetic events? And, and where right. do you where do you draw that line? Now, I'm I myself anymore. I'm, I'm pretty dogmatic on that, that the 70 weeks was messianic and not eschatological. Um, but I can still fellowship with with people who who look at it a different way. I think when looking at things like Second Thessalonians 2, which is notoriously difficult, it has been for the church for forever. Um, I, I, I this is where I am. I, I, I practice a lot of grace, um, and I am not as dogmatic when it comes to some of these things. Uh, you know, I look at it this way. You know, when when Jesus came at his first coming, the Jews had a a very particular idea of what Jesus was going to come to do, right? He was going to sit on the earthly throne of, of David. He was going to overthrow their oppressors. And he was going to be exalted, right? Uh, that's what they thought was going to have and happen. And of course, Jesus fulfilled scriptures very differently than what they had in mind. They didn't envision the Messiah dying on a cross. In like manner, when it comes to the second coming, I, I think there is a lot of ideas that are popular today that and people are very dogmatic and set in those things. And personally, I think that scripture is likely going to be fulfilled very differently than what we envisioned, which is why I said in second Thessalonians two, could it be, you know, um, we know second Thessalonians two tells us that, that the day of Christ, which is Christ coming in our gathering, isn't going to happen until first there's an apostasy and the man of sin be revealed. Right. But what if Jesus came tomorrow and we found out that we say, well, wait a second, Lord, I thought you said the Antichrist was supposed to be revealed. And he explains to us and he says, well, that, that, that Pope character was doing these very things. And, and, it, and that's how it was fulfilled. Maybe he explains it to us in eternity future, you know. I, I just leave the door open for things like that um, personally, uh, and I I try to be 
give give grace where I'm not so sure and 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 um and not be as dogmatic, especially on some of those particular areas. Like Matt said, maybe maybe there's a physical temple, maybe maybe there isn't. I don't think there's going to be, but you know, uh, I'm not going to let that you know get in the way of fellowship with another brother if they think differently and hopefully they would do the same thing with me i have we could get deeper into that why i think it's spiritual and um and, and not physical but um but i think you get the point there I, I can tell you i can tell you this there is a golden menorah candlestick sitting in the jerusalem quarter i've seen it it's under glass it's being guarded by the military a thing's worth over a million dollars it's solid gold and then they've got the ashes of the red heifer where they're trying to get the red heifer, uh, you know, make sure they got enough red heifers. I mean, there is the temple institute and the temple, whatever they call themselves over there, that are all about, you know, this. And that's why I can see where if they get what they want, they could go ahead and rebuild some physical sure. quote unquote, temple. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I leave that door open because I just want people to know, hey, if, if you start seeing a temple built, don't get excited. Uh, that doesn't mean anything. Right. right. But at the same time, I'm 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 like Pastor Clem. These are some of the things that are marginal, really. I mean, it's all it's it's like I said before, it's all going to pan out mm-hmm. like it's supposed to. And God will reveal it to us and show it to us. And we'll we'll be like the disciples. We'll be like, oh, duh, I should have seen it that way. And I never did. Yeah. Well, in, in Second Thessalonians, two, I think a key verse that we all forget about is in verse five, when he says, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth. Well, I don't know what withholdeth because I don't know what Paul's referring to because I wasn't with the Thessalonians when Paul told him these things. Now, ultimately what this passage he's doing is he is assuring these people that the day of Christ is not at hand. So, I can't assume and I can't just insert my own facts about what that is when I wasn't there. Now, I do think it's appropriate for us to speculate and to say, well, hey, we know this and this and this. Therefore, he could very well be talking about this. And I, and, I'm, and that's not wrong to do that. But I think what we've done with a lot of things with eschatology is we have we're reading all of our scriptures trying to force them into flawed boxes, into flawed timelines. And we're uh, trying to make Larkin's charts work, or we're trying to make even some of our post-trib charts work. And there's a lot of different ways some of these passages could be looked at. And I feel like in the IFB world, we're, we're not having a lot of conversations that we need to be having. It's like any time you dare think different than whatever the party line is. And it's the same thing in the post-trib world too, probably not as bad as in the pre-trib world, the, the people lose their minds. And and I yeah. the thing about this Daniel 9 stuff too is while it's kind of, you know, making my head spin a little bit, I think this helps the post-trib a ton, you know? And I, I think this, I think this leaves nothing for the pre-trib crowd. It leaves nothing for the people still expecting, you know, God to deal with Israel again and have this big revival. I think it leaves I think it leaves nothing for them. And it does seem very clear that Daniel 9 is in fact messianic and fulfilled. One of the one of the most amazing things is the way they they say that a any anyone's that's not pre-trib, post-trib, you know, that like myself, they said that I, we don't take the Bible literally that we allegorize everything and we spiritualize everything. Um, but I, I think that's laughable. Um, and the only thing that is dogmatic that we should be dogmatic about is the scripture itself. But I don't have charts as many, as many charts as they do. And I don't think you should trust anybody's charts, including my own. But when I started reading some of the stuff that Larkin had said about the pyramids and how that um, the, the, the fact that there were bat remains in one section of the pyramids, proving that bats escaped and that somehow is a proof of a rap that's a picture of the rapture because the bats flew away and the bat remains were proved that they used to be there I, i'm just I'm, I'm just shocked that people take that kind of stuff seriously and call that guy uh, a great scholar um because that is so extra biblical it's it's retarded yeah. uh, and, and and i just i can't believe how much 
extra biblical stuff there is in a lot of this eschatology talk um, and, and how that they just have this assumption built on another assumption. And it's kind of like talking to an evolutionist. You just have to, you just have to pull the rug out from under them and show them that, that what they have uh, their faith in isn't really solid Bible. And, uh, and that's why, I, that's why the title of the book is the King James Bible versus the pre-tribulation rapture, because let's just get back to what the Bible says and you show me what it's, you know, give me, give me just a, a passage that proves this. And they can't, I, mean, I can give you passages that prove salvation and what it is. And I can give you a passage that shows us a lot of things about different doctrines, but when it comes to the pre-trib rapture, they can't give you a solid passage. They'll give you Daniel nine. And then you show them what, what we've talked about tonight. Um, uh, and, uh, and then they'll, they'll say, well, Day of Christ really is Day of the Lord, which is the Alexandrian. That, that, that lines up with the Alexandrian text and, you know, changing it to Day of the Lord. And, and, and they, they, just, they just have to, and then they say the Great Tribulation. There is no the Great Tribulation. And there's never capitalized in the Bible. And on and on we can go. Um, but I think it's about being biblical and then, and then being gracious with all the things that we can't be dogmatic on. And um, as far as getting along with people, if anybody out there is searching, man, I'm their friend. Um, because Pastor Clem, his own testimony is, is that he thought I was an idiot and that he was right. And, and I don't blame him for thinking that because that's how he was raised. That's how he was taught. I used to think that too. Uh, <clears throat> but when you have someone you respect that says, I believe it this way, hopefully it's a hopefully it's a red flag or it's something that that stirs them enough to say i'm going to take an honest look at this i had no idea that pastor clem was studying all this um i had no idea that i was the one he that like he said tonight i had no idea that that i'm the one that got him onto this um eschatology the last time i knew he was not happy with me because of some things i had said about schofield and about eschatology but he was still cordial and friendly. And so I was just glad we were still friends, but I had no idea that he was doing a personal study for the last 10 years, 15 years until a few years ago. And I think there's a, a lot of people out there. They just want to, they want to be able to honestly look at the truth and not be beat up over it exactly. and, uh, and not be hounded into it. They, they need time. They need time to study it and to look at it on their own. Um, but, but I am very frustrated with the guys who want to label me or label us and call us names and, and put a label on us and say, you're an Andersonite or you're a preterist or uh, you're an anti-Semite or whatever it is, because they don't, they don't really have solid evidence or solid foundation. So then they throw names and ad hominem. And I, I just, I have no time for those people. I consider them to be unkind and dishonest um, because if I if they if I've written something that's doctrinally wrong in, in the book and, and biblically wrong, I, I have no problem with them calling me out on it. But if all they're going to do is label me, to me it's almost like an insecurity attack where they they can't they can't argue the facts. They just have to attack the, the person, the message. Right, right. That's that's what the radical left does and the cancel culture does. If they you know they just try to shut you up some other way. As you know, we started out this thing, Tommy, you said it, truth is never afraid of examination. And the whole idea of apologetics is that you defend your position, you defend your faith. Um, and so things shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't be, we, 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 we shouldn't be not willing to discuss issues um, because someone doesn't like their, their view challenged. Um, we should look at these things and we should do so with a gracious spirit. Um, I, I'm, you know, we've done very, some, something very different than, than the rest of church history in that we've, particularly in the last 100, 200 years, we have made that which is uh, secondary primary and what is, what is primary secondary. Um, you know, when you look back and, and, and I'm not, you know, I, I don't pastor a cradle church. I'm not, you know, I'm, I don't get into all the confessions and all that kind of stuff. But if you look at church history as a whole, in particular, when you look at what did they believe about the second coming? Was there a diversity of views? Yes. But what is the one thing that they all agreed on? That Jesus Christ was coming back again. I mean, that's that's the thing. If we're going to be dogmatic about something, let's be dogmatic about that, that Jesus is coming again. But as far as some of these the timelines and charts and, and all of these, these different things, I think there's 
I think there's room for disagreement. I think there's room for robust debate. And I think there's room for us to discuss these things without getting nasty and calling names and acting like you know, the progressive leftists out there that do that kind of stuff to shut down the conversation. Stop shutting down the conversation and let's talk about these things and let the scripture be our guide. Wherever scripture goes, we will follow. Let God be true and every man a liar, even if that means me or, or any of us on here. But let God be true when it comes to these things. And, 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 and here's the thing. Um, if anybody out there thinks that we're being divisive tonight, oh, my goodness. Um, Pastor Clem will tell you, I've been kicked out of a fellowship just because of what I believe, not because of any other reason, but just because I don't believe according to what they think I should believe. And it, 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 it's silly because I think that eschatology 100 years ago, I mean, I, I mentioned Philip Morrow. He was not premillennial, but he was still part of the fundamentalists, uh, the fundamentals volume, three different chapters. And then there's a. Uh, uh, the guy at Baylor, uh, Carroll, B.H. Carroll, um, and his brother J.M. Carroll, uh, B.H. Carroll, you know, he he was not premillennial either. Uh, he's a Baptist icon. But um, he said, you know, that these things are not something we separate over. Um, and I think premillennial is right. I, I think historic premillennialism is, is probably the, the term I would use. Um, but I, I just think it's silly when eschatology becomes primary and all the other things are secondary, like he said, like Brother, Brother Clem said. Um, we could learn. I think it's, it'd be healthy to have these conversations and to be able to have uh, good, good conversations and good debate that's, that's healthy and not just ugly and ad hominem, but good debate to learn, iron sharpening iron. Hopefully this video will cause some people to watch and listen and think. Um, but the idea of iron sharpening iron, I would love for a Bible college to open up some kind of a healthy debate, civil, where their students and anyone online could watch and just make up their own mind. Because I, I believe the same thing with creation and evolution. I don't think evolution should be taken out of the public schools. I think you ought to just have creation taught side by side from the Bible. And I think the students will figure out which one sounds more logical. Um, and the same thing with pre-trib and post-trib. I think if you just uh, would line up both of them and let both of them be taught from the same Bible and, and explain the viewpoint, I think it would become uh, pretty clear uh, for most which side they should take from the Word of God. And, and so it's almost an insecurity when there is a solid door that says you are not allowed in. And, um, and when a fellowship or a camp says, uh, we can't have you come to our camp, we don't even want your kids to come to our camp because of your eschatology. I mean, really, does a 10 year old kid at camp uh, pose a threat because his pastor has a different eschatology? There's just some silly separations that go on. Um, and, and to me, it's almost like they're, they're admitting how insecure they are and what they say they believe. Um, and so when, when you hear these guys labeling and stuff like that, I grit my teeth and, and I have no respect for that. I, I just, I, I lose respect for people uh, who, who just sling labels and, and mud and names calling. Uh, I, but I have no problem with a guy who says, well, I don't see it your way, but I still respect you as a brother. I, I have a lot of respect for that guy, and I appreciate that. He's being honest. He's not going to let me bully him either. He's not going to let me persuade him, but maybe the Holy Spirit will. And I just leave that up to the Holy Spirit. It's not my job to police the eschatology of every church. It's just not my job. But at the same time, I'm not going to just be quiet and, and stick, you know, tuck my tail between my legs and just pretend like I, I don't believe it anymore. Um, and if I write a book and you don't like it, don't read it. But I think I'm willing to say, hey, my name's Matt Furs. I'm sticking my reputation on the line and I'm letting you know, here's what I believe from scripture. And I'll say this, I've spent thousands of dollars printing books and I've stuck my name out there and if someone can show me from the word of God that I'm wrong, I'll burn those books and I'll just get on the Internet and say, I was stupid and I'm recanting. Mm -hmm. I, I will. I'm, I'm not afraid to do that. My pastor, Wayne Williams, used to offer a hundred dollar reward to anybody that could show him from the Bible that it, that it was wrong concerning the subject tonight. Um, inflation has risen. So a hundred bucks doesn't sound like much. But the point is the same. Right. Well, I think, you know, why? Why is it? not possible to just have intelligent conversations 
with most people on this because I do. I mean, just I've I've gotten so much just from tonight. I mean, I think this has been a fascinating conversation. I mean, it's it's helpful. It, it it challenges me, and because when I listen to other, I I listen to other people when they talk, because I I just assume most people came by their theology honestly, and I want to see how they did it. How how are they using the scriptures? And that's you know what was fascinating to me when I read that when I was reading your book is I'm like, and I listen you know Pastor Clem I listened to some of your messages on this, and I'm just like, this, I see where they're coming from. This makes a lot of sense. And then I kind of had to do a thing where I, I had to go check and challenge, you know, your interpretation, your hermeneutic. And it's like, well, actually, this this seems really legit. And uh, I think it does. It shows a major insecurity, uh, just a, a fragile ego when people can't when people can't talk about these things. And and that's where I'm at. I haven't gotten a whole lot of attacks um, you know, from my friends, but they won't talk to me and they don't want to talk to me about this. And, and, but the thing is a lot of these preachers who don't want to talk to me directly will gladly get up in their pulpit and talk about how messed up I am. And yet at the same time, it's like, why can you tell them that? But you can't tell me that, you know? And so here's the thing too, because, you know, a lot of people could take some of those things you said and you know, oh, you know, you're saying we should just listen to everybody. And obviously there's some things that are non-negotiable. Uh, and, you know, but at the same time, even if we're talking about a Catholic, okay, I'm not going to entertain Catholicism. However, shouldn't I be capable if I'm talking about Catholicism? Before I talk about Catholicism, shouldn't I find out what they're actually saying and what they actually believe before I address it? And people don't do that. When it comes to post-trib, when it comes to what we teach in replacement theology, they, it's like they haven't even looked into it. And it's like, well, if you haven't looked into it, you don't want to look into it. Fine, you don't have to, but don't talk about it. And I'm very available for people to talk to me about this. I am very kind. People who have called, people who call me up and will talk to me and challenge me to the face or over the phone. I give them a pass. If they say something really stupid, I'm not going to make a video expose them. I'm not going to talk about them from my pulpit. They had the guts to come talk to me. Now, if they're going to do this thing where they go get up behind a pulpit when they wouldn't talk to me and talk about me there, then I'm going to call them out. But people who will do it that way, who will, you know, I, I'll, I'm, I'm respectful. And I do. Like you said, that I think that would be awesome if a Bible college or something did that and actually allowed a, you know, and, and had a civil discussion about something like this, I think it would be so valuable. And you know what? If they're right, it's going to help their students because we're going to challenge them. We're, we're going to be out there. They're going to hear from us one way or the other. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I'm willing to, I'm willing to, to spend the, the thousand dollars printing books that I'm going to recant later and, 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 and then apologize publicly. I'm willing to do all that if I can learn something, if, if you can show me, if you, so, you know, for instance, I, I gave a, I gave one of my books to a pastor, but instead of that pastor responding, he gave the book to some theologian and that theologian wrote me a letter. And uh, I'm just disappointed in that, you know, because why didn't the pastor respond? That's who I gave the book to. Um, and, and at the same time, as I'm opening the packet from this theologian, this college, you know, teacher, um, I'm thinking, okay, I'm either going to finally learn what I haven't been able to understand all this time. And why, why all these other people are right and I'm wrong, or I'm going to just get a bunch of disappointing information. And that's what I got. I was disappointed. I'm not afraid to admit I'm wrong. I want to know what the truth is. And, and, and I'm, I don't need to be right just for my, just, just for my reputation. I want to know what the truth is. I don't have to, I don't have to have uh, sales of my book. I don't have to have any of that. I just want to know what the truth is, but I'm not seeing anybody talking about it. And on the other hand, I'm being encouraged by Pastor Clem and others that they're seeing things that they hadn't seen before. And that encourages me. And, 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 and I got letters. I got a letter yesterday from a guy telling me how much he appreciated uh, my stand and, and the teaching that I'm teaching because he's learning from it too. I got a call from an 80 year old preacher. And he said, I read your book. He's talking about the first book. 
He said, I read your book. He said, I'm not sure I agree with all that, but I, I see where you're coming from. And I really appreciate that. And, I, and you know what I told him? Man, I appreciate you calling me, you know? And he just, he just encouraged me. And uh, I feel like that guy's a friend. And, I, and, and most importantly, I feel like he's honest. I know guys that never talk to me, but I know they're talking about me just because of how they behave around me and how they behave with each other when I'm around them. Uh, and that's discouraging. That, that's, that's, so, that's, so, that's so discouraging. I, I just feel like uh, you mentioned Catholics. You know, not all Catholics are the same. And, and yet we all think we know everything about Catholicism. There are some saved Catholics out there. I, I, I'm sorry if that offends somebody, but there are some Catholics, I think, that are saved. Now, they need to get out of the, the religion they're in, and I think the Holy Spirit will lead them in that direction. But it's amazing how we study Catholicism in a school classroom, and then we decide we know everything about what they know. Um, now, I, please, it's a, it's a very fraction of a percent when I say that about, but I, I got a guy in my church. He got saved. Uh, and, and while he was a Catholic, he got saved. But eventually, God let him out of that, showed him, enlightened him, and showed him the truth. Uh, but we, we tend to do that with everything. We tend to fit everybody in a box and label everybody. And, and all we did was sit in a classroom and get, and get somebody's word on what these people are. Uh, we need to be careful of that. We need to be careful um, that, in this case, that you don't just decide that, that, that Matt Furs is an Andersonite or Matt Furs is a preterist because because he sounds like one or because that sounds close to one or whatever it might be. Um, healthy debate would be good. Iron sharpens iron. If we could have an agreement between King James Bible believers, uh, I think we'd, I think we'd all learn something from it. I think I learned something tonight listening to pastor Clem and you guys talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this, um, <laughs> there, I think there's a lot of fear out there with, um, with, with, coming out and changing your position. I, I know that's true in my, my own case. Um, you know, I was, I studied this out for years and I wrestled with things. And even when I was, was convinced that that post trib was correct and that Daniel nine was, was messianic. It's, it's one of those things that I was really afraid to, to come out and share that for fear of, of being uh, ridiculed or, or run off by people or, or whatever the case may be. Um, and, and I think part of that is just because right, wrong, or indifferent, I think there's this, this attitude that we have today over the last couple hundred years that that dispensational pre-tribulation theology is, is quote unquote orthodox. I, I mentioned in Matt's forward, that's how I felt when I figured out this guy was um, you know, when, when he was, you know, uh, post-trib, when he thought differently about eschatological things, I was, you know, all I've, all I've known is an IFB church or IFB churches. And so I was brought up with the impression that, that boy, if you're not pre-trib and, and dispensational, then there's something seriously wrong with you. You're, I mean, that's, that's, you're, you're, you're a heretic. You must be. And, and so, um, you know, which is, which is why it was helpful with Matt because I knew him and I thought well, this guy's, you know, he's, he's, he's so straight on these other things. How can he be, be wrong here? And that's where I think we really just need to get into studying the scriptures and let the scriptures speak for themselves. And, and we have to be careful when we read passages, especially like Daniel chapter nine verses 20 through four through 27, that we don't read our theology into the text, but that we let the scripture speak to us in its context and then conform our thoughts to it. And I'm telling you, that is incredibly difficult. This is the thing I wrestled with the most. It was so challenging to me because it was so drilled in my head that the he in Daniel 9, 27 was the antichrist. And I had to overcome that. And I'm looking at it right now where it says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And again, I, I, I like what was Matt brought this up earlier as far as you know, there are some people that accuse us of, of not taking the scriptures literally. Well, let's take the scriptures literally in Daniel 9, 27. Who is the he? Well, the he is an antecedent. It points back to a previous character, and there's only one of two choices. It's either Messiah the prince, or if the, the, the prince that shall come is different than the Messiah, I don't think it is, but if it is, if it's Titus, it can only be one of those two people. It's either Titus or it's the Messiah. Did Titus make a covenant with many? 
No, he didn't. He tried to make peace with the Jews, but he failed to do so. Titus is out. The only logical person then is the Messiah. But, but again, we got to get back to the Bible where we're looking at those things critically and we're, we're examining the text of Scripture in as much as we can to disassociate ourselves with our pre-canned ideas or the theology that we grew up with. And that was, honestly, that was the hardest thing for me. Um, and I have since moved away by and large from dispensationalism, the preacher rapture, all of those things, because the Bible has convinced me uh, more, more than anything else. And, and that's where we all say that. We all say that the final authority for faith and practice is the word of God. Well, well, in reality, that's not true for a lot of people. It's their theology or it's their church or it's their doctrinal statement or whatever the case may be. You know, and I challenge people, let the Bible be the Bible. You you look at that then, you tell me that that he in verse 27 is the Antichrist. Where in the context, anywhere is the Antichrist. We're inserting that character in there. We don't find him in the text. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, we had a lot of other things we were wanting to cover, but here's what I think we ought to do. I think we need to kind of shut it down here. I don't want this to go too long. And I think we're going to get challenged on some of this stuff, too, because um, let's just face it. You know, this is going to be this is kind of controversial. Um, and uh, so what we'll do, we'll kind of give it some time, maybe. And then if you guys like, we could have a follow up conversation, maybe co cover the rest of the things. Because there's a lot more that could be talked about on this subject. But then that way, too, if there are uh, some challenges and things people have out there, uh, you know, we can kind of address some of those, too. But. I do listen. It's gonna it's gonna bother people to admit they've been calling a passage about Jesus the Antichrist. And I can yeah. tell you that right now. It's nobody nobody's gonna want to admit that. Is yeah. stubbornness gonna kick in, and people gonna get crazy, and then you know, are we gonna get accused of all kinds of nasty stuff? I I don't know. I don't care that much. But at the same time, I do want. Uh, I do think this discussion needs to happen and i think this has been a really good one and so um i'll let you guys go ahead and have say a final word and then i think we'll close it uh for the audience and maybe we'll do a follow-up in the near future maybe after the holidays or something yeah um i think it'd be great especially if some people if if you if you decide to put this recording on the internet and and then field question or ask people to send in their questions and we could try to answer questions i I really enjoyed this. I, this is what I would like to do more often is just to have different pastors come on. And because I learned some things from Pastor Clem tonight um, and, and from yourself as well, just, just some different, because as a human being, you can't remember it all. Uh, there's just no way. And nobody's the expert. Nobody is the expert on something. Only the word of God is. And, um, and so I, I think that that's great. I think this is great. I, I think it was beneficial for us to do this tonight. I think we all came away learning some things and being appreciative of each other at the same time. Um, I want to say that it seems like whenever a serious issue like this comes up within um, Bible-believing churches, it seems like the devil always raises up a clown to become the lightning rod and the, the bad example of what we're trying to do. Um, and I don't mean to... I don't mean to be disrespectful or to hurt anybody's feelings, but but Peter Ruckman is was kind of a, a goofball in some ways. But as far as the King James Bible, he, he, he was right that the Bible was right. He was right that the word of God was the King James in the English. Um, but people rejected a lot of it because of him and his personal things and person, personality. And the same thing with eschatology. There might be some person out there that's a clown that that's just kind of what people want to point to, but I'm going to tell you right now, pastor Wayne Williams was no clown. And because of his influence and because of the respect I had of him as a Bible student, when I heard that he was not pre-trib, that's when I first sat up and said, now, wait a minute, this guy's a good man. Why is he not pre-trib? And that's where I started thinking. And tonight we, we now have, you know, these three of us saying it, and, and, and the more people can look at us and say, all right, is Matt Furs really a, a clown? Is he an idiot? Is he, a, is he, is he a, an antichrist worshiper? What, 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 what motivates him to be willing to stick his face out there in public and say what he's saying? And the same thing with Pastor Clem. What, I'm, just, I'm just hoping people will realize that there are good 
men with a decent reputation with churches uh, and people who love them and they love them who are preaching and teaching the word of God every week. And this is not the only thing we teach on. We, we teach the whole word of God. Um, and, and, to, and to look at that and say, I, I, want, I want to take a second look at this because this man who I respect is saying that it's not what we've been told. And I, I think that's, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm, I'm sticking out uh, my reputation on, you know, going on a limb and sticking my neck out to, to say, look, I'm willing to, to be called names and whispered about and, and banished from every, every camp or, or fellowship uh, to finally get some people to think. And I, I think it's worth it. And, and so I feel like I had to do it um, for the sake of truth. Um, and, uh, and I hope that the reputations we have will, will not be tarnished, uh, in a way that would cause people to say, yeah, that pastor, he fell off the deep end. And so that means his eschatology was wrong. Uh, I hope that the Lord will protect us from those things in our families and that we can continue to maintain a good, uh, example and reputation for people to respect as they look into this. Um. Yeah, I, uh, just in, in closing, I know there's going to be some people, uh, obviously you're, you're going to your your mind's going in circles i know mine was when i was first going through some of this stuff and um and and like you did tommy i i i i searched the scriptures because what i found found like i said this this whole idea of the 70 weeks prophecy being a linchpin for the for for essentially all the popular modern theories it's true because it unravels things and you have to rethink things. And how does this affect here? And does that jive? And is this conflict with scripture over here? And, and so it took a long time for me uh, to thoroughly go through those things and to make sure that, that there was an error, at least that I could find any error that in fact, what, what I thought what the Bible was saying was actually harmonious with other portions of scripture. And so I would just, um, if someone is struggling with this and, and thinks that we're absolutely crazy, um, I would encourage you to, as much as you're able to, be, be a Berean, re- receive what we've said tonight with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures, whether those things be so. And, and really, really study things out according to the context and be very, you have to be mindful, purposefully mindful that you're not reading your theology into the text. As much as you can, disassociate it from it and just let the Bible speak for itself and then follow where the Bible goes. Uh, One one last thing is I'm thinking about this. And this is one of those, you know, the more I study this, the more the more things are are brought to my attention. And and I'll just say this, because we've recently been going over the book of Daniel um, in our Wednesday night church services, our Bible studies. And and one of the richest Bible studies personally that, that I have ever done is is on Daniel 9 24 through 27 as far as the messianic aspects of it um it is so rich and so glorifying to Christ um as far as how these things were unfolded and how they're fulfilled in the New Testament and what the New Testament says about these things it is it is just so incredibly rich um but one of the things that that I thought about was um you know, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple the first time around, you know, with, with Babylon and being exiled to Babylon, that was a pivotal point in, in the nation of Israel's history. In, in fact, in the Bible, that is a turning point, a pivot point. It was well documented. It was well prophesied. It was a huge deal in the Bible. And, and to think in, it, it, it put it this way, it was a momentous occasion. Well, isn't the second destruction of Jerusalem and the temple just as momentous? It is. And think about this. If there is all of this scripture that's given to the, the destruction of the first temple, um, wouldn't there likely be scripture that would describe what's going to happen for the, the second time around? And in fact, there is. This is why I believe, in particular, Daniel 9 through 12 and the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and, and the, other, the other gospels there, I believe that those are the scriptures that talk about the destruction the second time around. And if those things aren't, if we all relegate them or reassign them to, to future events, then there is no scripture in the Bible that talks about 
what is equally a momentous occasion in the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple the second time around. Would God do that? Would God be silent on such an issue? No, I don't think so. So I think it gives more weight and credence to that. But again, search, search the scripture. I like the idea if people have questions and things like that. Yeah, sh- uh, shoot them, shoot them our way. And, um, you know, um, if Tommy, people reach out to you, uh, I, I guess, you know, let, let Matt and I know and, and we'll, um, we'll think on those and see if we can address those. I like that idea. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely, folks, uh, email your questions, you know, leave comments uh, a- asking about these things. And we'll definitely try to talk to him. I think one thing that was mentioned several times tonight, if, if you walk away from anything we need to take is stop trying to read your theology into the text. You know, let the text decide your theology. So I appreciate you guys doing this. I, I got a ton out of it. I loved it. And I look forward to doing this again. So uh, to all of you watching, thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks.